Anybody have any questions for Simon? Yeah. Yeah, I've got I've got one. I'll, I guess I'll just go ahead and ask it. And that is, uh, what's your expectation with regard to um, a the, uh, the the protocol? Do you think one protocol will fit all of the ECROA organizations, or are we looking at three different protocols for three different organizations? Uh, I think we're looking at different protocols for different organizations. My understanding of the process is that um, uh, once we get one over the line, uh, the others will follow uh, more easily than, than if they were the first. However, each will need to be modified according to uh, different parameters of, of the standards. Don't forget that the standards kind of compete with each other, and so they do need to differentiate themselves. For example, with the VCS, I imagine the focus will be on uh, the fixed carbon content within biochar, whereas with the gold standard, uh, I imagine it'll be that plus um, co-benefits uh, that will require certification. Um, where we're going with it at the moment is uh, a, perhaps, and this isn't decided now yet, brother, but, but it's just an idea, uh, is to have a, a relatively generic um, certification process that allows you to calculate the fixed carbon content of the biochar in line with the IPC statistics, which have been recently published. And the following on from there, in other words, once it's left the factory or the, or the production site, um, adopting a, a perhaps a more modular approach, which will allow for accurate certification that accommodates all the various different usage or application techniques that are emerging. So soil application, putting it into asphalt, using it as a water filtration um, material, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's, that's, that's the current thinking, but um, it, it's, it's still work in progress. Simon, there's a question from George Kim Chafee oh. <clears throat> saying, why wouldn't it make sense for the US to adopt the EBC standards or a modified version rather than reinventing the wheel? <laughs> Sure, sure. Why does it make sense with you? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you're referring to reinventing the wheel as, as the process that I'm proposing to go through, then that's the, the, the process itself, that the first stage of it is to review all of the methodologies that currently exist. Um, everything going back to Carbon Gold's methodology, which was developed back in 2009. The IBI took a version of that and, and put it, tried to put it through the ACR. Um, we have Carbon Future, which is the EBC certification, and we also have uh, Puro as well. So that there'll be a consolidation of all, all of those methodologies or, or review, if you like, um, and then um, uh, that they'll use that as the foundation and then, and then build from there. So the EBC certificate will certainly be utilized. In, in my view, it is probably the most robust and thorough uh, out there at the moment. And also it, it um, carries out that crucial bit of, you know, what do you do with the bar char? Uh, after it's been produced, because in, in theory, uh, with with the Puro mechanism, uh, Puro certification at, at the moment, you could buy a, a ton of biochar, you know, the producer would get their certificate, and then you could stick it on your barbecue. But so you you do need to uh, monitor that that final last mile, so to speak. Okay, thanks. Looks like a, an open I, question. That answers your question. Yeah. Everybody, what characteristics are optimal for feedstock from an agricultural application? How to grate fine prunings and straw residue rate as by the quality. Anybody have a good answer for that? We have uh, been training. I didn't hear lot. the question. It, it's in chat. Can you see the chat? It's, a, it's the second one. Um, we have been training. Um, uh, vineyard, a lot of vineyard managers over many years on the conservation burn technique, which produces char. It's not, you know, super high quality, but actually we've had some tested and it's not bad. Um, and that's worked well. Um, but I don't know of any uh, tests other than I think Hans Peter Schmidt. Uh, I'm not sure where, whether or not he used great fines for his uh, study in Tuscany. Does anybody know that? Yeah, I'm afraid I don't. I don't have any uh, particular expertise in that. I'm not sure if we. Does anybody else? I think you have uh, a lot of different. Uh, you know, depending on the feedstock, you have different qualities of biochars. So here in China, you've got, or here in China, 
Uh, last year, you had 500,000 tons of biochar produced from wheat straw and, and corn stover. And you've got corn biochars from corn stover being fed and being used successfully in agriculture and in Africa, places like that. You've got pits, nuts, and shells. So I think the answer is that you can use a variety of feedstocks, but the applications may slightly differ and the quality of the biochar certainly will differ. Again, for those who came in later, um, please uh, enter your question into the chat box and point it towards a certain speaker or just to everyone. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I would just add to what Tom was saying that, uh, you know, the big issue seems to be in terms of biochar quality with respect to egg residues and the like is, uh, you know, the, the ash content and how high is that. And that also depends on production methods. So um, it, both are relevant. And for most things like, I think, vineyards and straw, um, the lignin content might be a little higher for the vines than it would be for the straw, but uh, compared to lignin content of some other feedstocks, uh, it's relatively low, like walnut shells, for example, has very high lignin, which tends to give you a, a higher, uh, a, a more recalcitrant char at least. Um, so I don't know if there's a quick answer other than it depends they're all good and it just depends on how it's made and uh, what the purpose you're, you're planning to use it for. I don't know if that helps, Stefan. Um, uh, another uh, point is that if you're making it, making it from grapevines and then you're gonna return it to the vineyard, you are kind of recycling the minerals at least that mm -hmm. grapes use. So that's an advantage. Um, you don't have to pay for inputs twice there. And the, the other big difference is density differences in feedstocks. So, um, and then like Jim said, temperature makes a big difference in quality. Well, there are a lot of vineyards that are now looking for a, a more sustainable way than burning their material um, to process it. So um, we're, we're starting to get a lot of interest there. So I think we'll, we'll get more data on that as, you know, in the years to come. And that's just building on the traditional uh, techniques of field burning, you know, it was always done uh, for sanit sanitation and also nutrient cycling. So it's really something that agriculturalists have always done. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's part of what, what I was, you know, sort of what I was trying to say at the end, there are many, many, you have to meet people where they are and it would be fantastic. I mean, our dream is to have you know, regional uh, pyrolysis, you know, in, in every community. And, you know, it's kind of like the model of the Stockholm biochar project and what Brett is trying to do in, uh, in Colorado is, is um, to use the material that you have, you know, wh where you, where you are. And in some cases you do it in the field. In some cases you could do it in, in a carbonator and some, you know, or in other cases you could do it and take it to a nearby a processing facility where you can capture the heat and use the gases. You know, there's no one way to do it. Um, and so, you know, ideally we wouldn't, uh, you know, maybe do as much burning as we do, but that's gonna be a long way off before we have, you know, efficient um, technologies that we can take around, you know, other than what Kelpie's doing and what other people are doing, which is definitely a step up from from field burning. So, so there is another question there um, about biochar as a feed supplement. Anybody want to tackle that one? Um, I can make a mention to that. Uh, Kelpie, I think you've done a lot of work on this as well. Uh, in the US, no. Um, in California, yes. Um, so that's the, the summary. Uh, I think Tom, Miles, you, you've been kind of working on this as well. Uh, so. Charcoal was uh, on the on the accepted list with USDA um, until I believe 2010. Um, so there, there, I think there could be some loopholes with activated carbon, uh, as far as USDA is concerned. Um, but in California, biochar um, just 
straight on through. Uh, in fact, I just had my most recent um, uh, client uh, purchase uh, biochar for use as animal feed in trials right now um, to see how that's working. Um, and, uh, and we were able to do that fully above the board, which was, which was kind of fun. Um, so I'll leave that to anyone else who wants to add more. Oh, I got a question to the, the California Department of Food and Ag then supersedes whatever the, the federal uh, restrictions might be. It works. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, I didn't, uh, I, I looked at it briefly. Uh, it was confirmed at a high level. So we did kind of get confirmation from the person of concern. Um, I, I don't re recall the details of, of that right now, but I know that it, those questions were asked and answered. Mm -hmm. So a year ago, a year ago, the California Department of Food and Agriculture said we are following the Food and Drug Administration uh, ban on charcoal. And then just within the last year, CDFA has approved at least two products. Um, and so they have to meet certain criteria. And the, and the, the testing that's going on right now um, at the University of Nebraska has been following over, I think, a four-year period so far, uh, a very careful managed program, which has been approved at every step by the Food and Drug Administration. In other words, FDA came out and said, we want you to approve these three uh, uh, benefits. There had to be a non-toxicity, uh, no dioxins, uh, a demonstrated beneficial nutritional uh, benefit, some other things. And so Andrea Watson, who's doing the studies, has been chipping away at those at those tasks. And the first stage was done in vitro, no animals. The next stage was done with one animal. And, and I think she's worked up to uh, uh, multiple animals now. That's kind of the process. And then I think it's probably going to take, from a national point of view, it's probably going to take the Cattlemen's Association and the animal nutritionists and that uh, animal husbandry community to buy off on it. At least that's been my experience with food or feed additives in the past. What about the guy in Canada who was doing that that study? Um, do we know, has he published a, a paper on that? That was published and I think it was primarily uh, a reduction of methane emissions. It wasn't necessarily on animal nutrition and the Food and Drug Administration has leaned on the uh, uh, demonstrating nutritional benefits. I see, okay, good. I have some anecdotal reports from the, the study in Canada at University of Lethbridge because I had a nice long conversation with the feed blender who provided the, the blends with the biochar. And what he told me was that the reduction in mortalities was significant. And that just from the, and the weight gain as well. And just from that standpoint, he was starting to use it with his private clients as well. So. Um, you know, if you just base it on methane reduction, there are a lot of other benefits to animal feed that, that have to do with animal health and weight gain. Can I uh, make, point out something? Um, I have experience of this in Europe. I was uh, co-chair of working group three of cost, the cost action. And my co-chair was Dr. Saren Sohi from the UK Biochar Center. So what Oh, what we did uh, from the beginning all the way through 2016, the EU pumped in nine and a half million euros to do um, studies on all sorts of uses of biochar. One of them was double blind studies on uh, animal feed. It is legal in Europe uh, to provide um, a blended char and it has to meet certain requirements in the EU. Uh, there's an EU directive and also EU regulatory uh, regulations that uh, do that. In the United States, and I have done, uh, I've been in the business of bringing innovations to the marketplace. One of them is, is going through FDA approval. Uh, the FDA approval that uh, we would seek in our business would be the kind that's in Europe where it's sold through veterinarians, uh, kind of like a drug uh, and prescribed. Um, and that's what the EU has done. I think the FDA, and I've had some conversations with FDA people here that, uh, that I've done business with in the past. And they told me that uh, uh, they would prefer ultimately to have, um, have it regulated through the FDA. And uh, Kelpie's absolutely true. It's uh, right on spot on. The big benefit is the mortality rate reduction in the cost action double blind studies. Um, 
all types of livestock showed a 50% reduce, reduction in mortality rate at a minimum. And that included not just cattle, it also included sheep, um, uh, you know, fowl, uh, like chickens and things like that. So there's a lot of opportunity, I think, in that marketplace. Isn't there, a, wasn't there also an increase in uh, live weight? Uh, yes, there, there are other things, but right. I think the big thing to the livestockers, the big issue to them, at least in Europe, is the mortality rate reduction. The weight gain is important, obviously, but that in itself was not the big deal. There's a huge market around the world for replacement, uh, like for instance, if we're gonna talk about um, uh, mortality rate in cows, uh, especially cows that are going to slaughter, right, for food. So um, it, the reduction in that is, uh, is, is really important because there's a huge market in replacement. Most of the, the our data showed that most of the deaths that did occur in, in cattle was mostly with heifers and, and calves, uh, not the older cows that were on their way to the slaughterhouse. Uh, but remember, also another important point about this is that you know right now we're all experiencing COVID-19, right? That's a zoonotic disease. That means transmitted from one species to another. The last time there was a big problem with livestock was in the UK, uh, Ireland, and Northern France in which they had to wipe out all the cattle every one of them. Mad cow they had uh, mad cow disease, which translates into um, uh, Jacob Crutzfeld disease in humans. And it killed a bunch of humans, but they got, they got it really quick. And they, they, but they wiped out a whole industry. Billions and billions of euros got wiped out. But we, we believe, at least from our perspective, is that, that that's a great opportunity because if you formulate it correctly, you not only reduce the, uh, the mortality rate, but you also, especially in cattle, because they have four stomachs, you, ha you have the ability to probably inoculate the, the cattle against uh, transmission of viruses. Great, thank you. Anybody want to tackle Hugh's question? Well, don't everyone speak at once now. Uh, I have a question. I'm actually putting that to Simon more, more than uh, preferably in that uh, I've kind of gone through this in detail and, and I'm quite concerned that the, the, especially the fixed carbon test, when you do it uh, according to the protocols is really taking the material to such a high temperature, it's changing it entirely. It's making a yeah, different I've... material and that could, it creates a lot more fixed carbon. It makes it look a lot better on carbon sequestration, but it's not true. I mean, for example, sugar is 25% fixed carbon according to that test. And sugar will be a tough one to get a carbon credit for. Just reading your question here. Um, uh, I'm not a methodology developer, so I'm not gonna be able to answer this question with uh, any, any degree of, uh, or not the degree of accuracy that I think you require. Uh, however, um, all I can say is that I, I'll ensure that the process is carried out in, in the most you know, thorough way possible. And also part of that process is uh, an external third party review. So um, any feedstock, uh, sorry, any feedstock, any feedback of this kind uh, can be incorporated into the, uh, into the development process. Uh, it might be worthwhile to perhaps uh, if you could connect me into that group and I'll provide the studies I've done and they can at least take them under advisement. With pleasure. Thank you. Great. Okay. How about um, Jeffrey's question about renewable feedstocks? Simon, I, I think you're going to be hot here. I, I think that this kind of, um, I've got some thoughts and I, I'd, I'd like to kind of answer a little bit to that, but basically just formulate more questions and pass them mm -hmm. on to you, Simon. Um, I think one of the critical uh, pieces of, of information here is, is the words emissions reduction credit. Um, so biochar is a carbon dioxide removal, um, but during the process of biochar production and application um, and the waste management, aspect, we can also have emission reduction stacking on top of and into the whole equation. And so, um, you know, it's a really interesting thing. Biochar is a carbon dioxide removal, I think is really important, but then how do we account for the emissions reductions associated with that? 
Um, and particularly with um, food waste and things that are of low carbon content, how do we make sure that, um, that they're not uh, dinged too heavily, such as currently in America, uh, the uh, association uh, APCO, I forget what the acronym go goes for, but basically anything below 60% carbon is not biochar. Um, and so a lot of the biochar made from manures, which could be a great product and have a great greenhouse gas emission reduction profile uh, would not even be acceptable as biochar under current America practice. So two things in there, there's the um, manure and then there's also the emissions reduction. Simon, I think I'd be curious to hear what, what you got to say. Sure. Are, are we looking at this, the question from Hugh in relation to the IBI and EBC standards? No, the Jeffrey Hallowell to everyone, renewable feedstocks such as food waste, digestate, human waste and manures often have less than 50% carbon content. Yeah. If they can get a 50% greenhouse gas emission reduction credit and need to be diverted from landfills, will the total carbon footprint be considered for future standards rather than just percent carbon? And I think when he's saying percent carbon, perhaps Jeffrey, you can fill in here, but I think percent carbon. Okay. Um, the, um, so let me just get this straight. So you're, you're talking about the, uh, the, the, the entire life cycle. In other words, the, from, to take harvesting the feedstock all the way through to production and use um, where the, the, the carbon reductions take place um, as part of that entire life cycle, not or, or production cycle, not just the fixed carbon content of the actual material. Is, is that what you're asking about? To make it sure is. that that's, that's acknowledged? Yeah, so yeah, yes, for, for sure. Because the greenhouse gas emission credits are actually higher than what the biochar is worth. And in some circles, like Josiah mentioned, because it's 50, it's usually around 50 or a little bit under 50 carbon content, it's not considered as biochar, but it looks yeah. like biochar. <laughs> but uh, but we, I'm getting more money on carbon credits right now and, and nothing really for the biochar. So that's kind of wrong. If we could combine it together, it could add more value and create a, a new market or a bigger mm. market. Yeah, I mean, one of the methodologies, one of the methodology developers uh, that I'm, I'm talking to at the moment, um, we're, we're looking at sort of project cycles, just as you've described. So um, if you were, for example, to take a, um, uh, a pile of biomass residue on a um, almond shelling processing site, for example, um, that, that goes all the way through to being turned into biochar for, um, for, for fertilizer additives, just, this is just an example, uh, then th there, there are the carbon assets sit, multiple carbon assets sit within that entire process over and above the fixed carbon content of the biochar that's produced by the pyrolysis machine. So e even to the point where you can certify the avoided em emissions from taking that biomass uh, out of a heap where it could anaerobically digest and produce methane, you know that that there's there's a carbon asset there that can be um, sort of quantified. Similarly, when you put it through the pyrolysis machine, you obviously you get energy production, which replaces fossil fuel use. There's 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 carbon reduction taking place there, um, and then you've got the yes the the carbon single carbon removal function of the, of the biochar because it's of its fixed carbon content. But then in its end use as well, potentially you could put it into a fertilizer mix, you could use it for um, a reduced irrigation requirement. All of them have a, um, a re reduction in carbon use um, function as well. So you need to look at, in my view, the entire sort of end-to-end uh, -end carbon life cycle in order to properly monitor all of the carbon reduction and carbon sink functions of that process. So do you think there will be a LCA life cycle analysis credit versus just the output in looking at the feedstock and the value of harvesting it to the environment rather than just the carbon percent output? I think it's more likely that you'll see methodology developers looking at multiple um, uh, certification opportunities for the different sort of carbon reduction functions that I've just run through rather than a single certification that can draw a circle around all of that. I think that might be too complex because it's so project specific. Okay, well, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So it's a matter of cobbling together different, different reduction, different credits for the different stages of whatever process you might want to put together then. Yeah, 
and, 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 and as far as I'm concerned, I, I think that's a good thing because what that means is that the, the biochar projects can get going now um, where the, the door you're walking through is carbon reduction because there are, there are, there are certifiable, car, certifiable carbon assets in that whole cycle that what I've just described. Uh, and, and of which there'll be many other cycles, you know, where there, there are also carbon assets there. So you can begin to monetize the carbon reduction impact of your activity while we're waiting for the actual, you know, mythical bar jar meth to get um, uh, drafted and approved. So there's, uh, for, for me anyway, that, that, that presents an opportunity to, to, to get going um, with carbon reduction bar jar projects right, right is, now. Is um, there still going to be that? Technology. The line of fifty percent, or does it matter? Why does it I can't answer that when... question? I'm afraid. Okay. I, I don't. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. But um, I, I'm, I'm. If it means that it rules out, an in, you know, several important categories of, uh, of feedstock, then I hope not, because that would be uh, a, a huge wasted opportunity. Uh, and plus, don't forget, we're we're in um, we're in crisis mode at the moment. So I don't think. Um, uh, it, 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 anything and everything needs to be done so um i wouldn't rule that out by any means thank you this note a comment from john Miedema about uh the issue of defining biochar with having a certain amount of carbon and i don't know john if you want to expand on that at all here let me let me comment on that because uh the it really the the 50 or 60 percent carbon, you know, comes from different sources for different applications. In the particular case of the uh, of, of the use as soil amendment for uh, the American Association of Plant Food Control Officials, the background there was specifically for labeling for application and as a soil amendment. And I think it's important to understand that those standards or regulations are a political process. Uh, we went to the American Association of Plant Food Control Officials thinking that we were talking to a group of scientists and bureaucrats who, who didn't have a particular agenda. And we found that that 60% was landed on by a particular official who was able to sell the concept as being, well, here's a metric. Here's how you measure the amount of carbon and biochar. And, and that can be changed and it can be modified. We haven't done that yet but it's uh, within our USBI ability with AFCO to change that 60% number to allow the, what we had proposed was the IBI categorization of 10% carbon or more, 30% carbon or more, 60% carbon or more. And what they landed on was the 60% carbon. So uh, in that particular case, that 60% number can be changed. For other uses, the 50% and so on, I think we need to look at what it's going to take to uh, uh, to get the biochar products uh, uh, recognized and accepted. Um, if I can just jump in there, thanks, Tom. I, I appreciate what you're saying, but coming from the biochar community, it's really important that we don't uh, that we educate the regulators on just that because. You know, when we're making designer chars uh, to get functionality and using the thermochemical process as part of the reaction body, um, you know, we're engineering materials that are going to have high value, but we're uh, impregnating the minerals within the carbon lattice work. And in order to do that, I've got to make materials that are oftentimes, um, oftentimes, um, you know, even 40% carbon based so you know that that's just going to be part of what i'm call, calling you know biochar 2.0 when we're engineering these materials through the retort and we're, we're having some very interesting and i think it's been alluded to during this uh, very good conference that I've, I've been able to come in and out of um that this biochar 2.0 is going to open up some very significant markets particularly in remediation right now um you know harvesting phosphorus Trying to starting to look at actually look at harvesting phosphorus from systems and making it plant available, so that we can get away from the you know my biggest fear in agriculture right now is actually peak phosphorus, um, and we have an opportunity with the nuances that we can do with the chars through the retort to solve some of the problems I believe in our agriculture sector for nutrient cycling. It's very very important that we be able to talk about the amount of carbon within the material 
how that carbon got into there and we can base it on you know that unit weight or whatever based on the life cycle of the machine that makes sense so if i have 30 percent carbon that's lay biocarbon biomass derived it should have the same value um, as the carbon that's uh 90 if it's derived from biomass or whatever if that makes sense it, it shouldn't be based on the end carbon amount in that unit um, you know that pill or in that if that makes sense to you guys anyways i'll let it go at that 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 certainly makes sense to me um in terms of uh, being able to, able to measure the total amount of carbon, whether it's 60, 30 or, or, or whatever. Uh, and, that, and that's the uh, that, that's the unit that needs to be monitored and verified. All right, so the, the chat seems to have toned down a little, and I'm thinking maybe what we should do is just go through the uh, speakers for today and see if there's any questions for on any of the talks that came up. And, um, we could start, I guess, from, from the beginning. We'd start with me and the talk I gave uh, and anyone else associated with the Washington State University uh, workshop. So uh, are there any questions about the presentation I gave this morning? All right, so then we had five uh, talks after mine and the first one, yeah. excuse me. This is Mark Fuchs. Yeah. Hey, um, maybe you could, just for the sake of clarity, contrast the overall uh, research picture that you presented versus the individual work groups. In other words, that there's sort of an overall large scale uh, research program that you laid out. It was a, a long, a long period, 50 years or something like that, multiple sites. But each of us in the work groups laid out a, a, a more discrete picture. And I don't know if that confused people or not, but I thought maybe, maybe adding some clarity there might be useful. Yeah, I guess what I'm I'm thinking is what I was proposing was sort of like in, in many ways an umbrella that would encompass the larger issue of the fundamental science that needs to be done. And that most of what was presented, I think, in the other groups, um, the, the working groups was more bite-sized pieces of that and also stuff that's more what we'd fall into the near-term research and development and the market development uh, oriented side of it. And that's not to say that it, it wouldn't fall, some of it wouldn't fall in the, the more basic stuff, but it was meant to provide the, the underpinning for all the other work that, that gets done. Um, not sure if that, quite answers your question, but um, the idea was more to look at some big picture things, big picture funding sources, and set them up so that that fundamental work would be done over the long term, and we would have that stability of funding. I know Kristen in her talk talked about the, the whole issue of stability of funding being a real issue, and and hers, of course, she was looking at a long-term project as well. Um, and, and actually it's part of what, what I proposed, I think, too, they overlap significantly. But um, I think the main issue is just that we, if, if we're going to do something with biochar and, and where this sort of came from in my thinking on it was, in the first 10 years, we need to put a major effort into answering most of the big questions. And then in the following decades, we would sort out things like, okay, longevity in soils under this treatment or that treatment and so on and so forth. Some of these longer term questions would be answered, but in 10 years and even in five years, in some cases, we if we put enough effort into it, we could pretty well answer any of the questions that are out there. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done 
developing new, you know, there's a whole engineering task. There's another task that I didn't mention that could probably easily fit in there that has to do with the non-biological uses of biochar after, after it's created. And these were talked about by several speakers in the conference. So um, the point is we need a good solid decade of intense effort to really push, push the limits and really define things down to the point where in subsequent decades, people have a much better idea of what sort of policies will work and um, what, where, where the profit is to be made in the whole thing. I don't know if that helps. Um, I think that's useful. And I, I also think that amongst the five work groups, there was a lot of opportunity for working across those work groups from one work group to another, providing char from, you know, work group one to, uh, you know, the compost group or the agricultural, uh, long-term agricultural uses. So there's there's a lot of opportunity to integrate those those ideas that we threw out. Yeah. Could I assume? work group really quick that I don't know if it was made really clear today. I think the one thing that I came away from is independently each group talked about the high importance of integration of biochar and biochar production within a larger system that, you know, we, we have to find all the ancillary benefits of biochar and its production pathways. And we can see that there's you know, there's all kinds of different chemical constituents that can come off the vapor state and there's all kinds of, you know, and there's heat that's made and then there's the carbon itself. And that we have to find value in the heat production or we have to find value in the carbon, in, the, in all of the constituents that come off of it and integrate it within bigger systems. You know, it, it, we co-locate these systems, I think is really, really important for the longevity of it becoming, um, a valuable pathway. I, 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 for my own, like the way we've done, like looking at different models, it's the only time it ever kind of pays back is when we integrate within other systems. That was kind of my, one of the things that I took away is that I think all of us across the different um, work groups talked, you know, that integration was important. Okay, so any other questions for that 80 minute segment? Um, we could, Gloria Floor gave a, a nice presentation um, on, on their working group idea. Uh, Jim Dooley gave a presentation, he's not here, but I noticed that Han Supan, who was a co-author of that is here and he's, he's available to answer any questions. Um, and then we went to Tom Miles' presentation. And then Mark Fuchs, and finally Kristen Tripp. And if we have any further discussion, that's that's fine. Um, we can move on to the other presentations that were made this morning, because we have about twenty minutes left here. Can, can I ask a question in relation to what John? Uh, forgive me if I've not pronounced your surname correctly. Miadima just uh, asked. Um, you, you were talking about the, the, the fact that production systems need to integrate with um, as, as part of larger systems. Um, do you mean larger production systems in addition to the production of energy, condensate, um, wood tar, and perhaps carbon credits? Is it um, are there other sort of production systems into which a biochar production system needs to be incorporated in your view in order to be profitable? Um, well, I think you need to include waste recycling at some point, you know, I mean, like for one of the models we're looking at here uh, is taking in food waste, using waste heat to support worms, you know, in, in, in the Pacific Northwest all year round. Um, you know, doing the, the condensing of the vapors so that we, because I'm curious in, in some of the things that we're seeing with the, with the pyroligneous acid. Um, so the, for us, the, wor the worms and the food waste and the tipping fees we can get from processing food waste and fermenting it is some of the other things. You know, we looked at, um, I, I thought a very interesting um, integration of um, the, the shrimp farming 
one that was talked about, I believe, yesterday. It's those kind of systems that I really see higher values and further integration of, you know, nutrient cycling in that case, right? Um, and nutrient cycling in the case that I'm talking about. Um, and 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 uh, yeah, that that's that's what I mean. Like we have to kind of eke out everything we can out of the thermal load. You know, like up here in the Northwest, we could potentially, you know, co-locate with hemp dryers because there's a lot of seasonal drying of, of food around here or, or agricultural products. And, um, you know, we have to find those values in the forest, trying to, that's one of the things I, I'm really, really interested about pyroligneous acid is because that's, um, when you look at the mass, generally, if I've got this right, and Tom can correct me, it's about 30% of the mass balance um, and about 5% of the energy. So you can imagine if we can find value in that aqueous phase that you can export. And, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of anecdotal evidence and some good work that uses an antifungal agent um, for agriculture. You know, th those types of things, we have to find all the values that are potential. Um, the, the acid that you're talking about, is that also known as wood vinegar? Yeah, 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 wood. yeah, okay. And, it, and it's something that needs to be investigated because there's, you know, there's potential toxins in there, right? We see values, but I don't know that anybody's, to, to my, you know, I'm a first do no harm kind of a researcher, right? And, and I think we, while we see great values, um, I personally am not going to sell that stuff to anybody until I see toxicology studies done and they're not cheap to do. You know, we, we have to understand what we're putting out there. And, uh, but it, there's, there's real value for, for us as an industry in that pyroligneous acid potentially. And we have to understand it because that's something we can take out of the woods and, and use if, if it has value, right? There, there's every indication for us in the Northwest, uh, our forests are seeing um, the, the Swiss needle cast. Uh, Swiss needle cast could potentially within, you know, my own studies, um, there's some potential there that we could maybe be, you know, benefit something like that. I'm not saying it does, but, but we need to look at it. Uh, there's some real values that we could eat, that we could squeeze out of that, that part of the, of the equation. I agree. There's um, a good case study of that happening in Cambodia, uh, a project being implemented by the, uh, the Husk team, HUSK, mm -hmm. um, which is definitely worth looking at. They, they're selling uh, wood vinegar as, I think, uh, a biostimulant and also a natural herbicide. Yeah, it, it's, it's been used through, you know, there's quite a bit of history of its use and there's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of um, you know, around the world. The problem is in North America, to, we have to do the research here with our universities here and public here. Of course. You yeah, get allowed. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I would love to sure. see um, a competition. I thought about this before um, in, from a system standpoint. Um, could engage all the you know big universities and and you know to figure out how you know who, who, it's sort of like the X Prize, but uh, coming up with the the most uh, total use of every, of all the you know pieces coming out of the biochar process um, or something like that. I think we could you know go far if we had some sort of a, a, a contest to challenge people to try to come up with these whole systems thinking, um, I don't know, just an idea. Maximum carbon benefit or something like that. Maximum utilization of the carbon for minimum, exactly. minimum waste. In the yeah. whole process. Uh, kind of like the shrimp idea, you know, where they're, you know, utilizing every single piece of it and there's no waste. Um, you know, that type of a system. And it's just what John has been talking about is, you know, getting the most bang for your buck out of the process. I had a quick question. So um, we heard Kelpie Wilson's presentation, which I thought was phenomenal. Um, and her approach is distributive type of systems, uh, small systems that are mobile and, and then we also heard, and I forgot which presenter came back in today, I think, with a discussion of, about larger systems that are more centralized. Um, and I thought, I just wanted to ask, does anyone think, anybody think that there's one benefit over the other, or is it uh, project specific? I think it's project specific. Um, well, 
Uh, this is a Han. Uh, I just I would like to uh, chipping in a little bit to uh, answer the question. Um, the so uh, my group uh, group two. We've been um, uh, focusing on the, the uh, mobile biomass conversion technologies. It's sort of the uh, uh, moderate scale. So you're looking at ten to uh, uh, yeah, about the ten to thirty thousand ton of the wood. The, the uh, no, so less than uh, less than ten thousand ton of the biochar production per year using a mobile biomass technology. So idea behind that is the uh, about trying to minimize uh, handling cost, uh, the transportation cost of the, raw, uh, the hauling raw material to the one central fixed location. So um, uh, by converting the biochar um, uh, near or at uh, uh, in the forest, uh, that you can effectively uh, reduce the, the, the volume and the weight of the, the, the feedstock uh, converting into the biochar, which uh, the uh, uh, the help reduce tra the transportation uh, cost significantly. Based on our uh, waste to wisdom study, we could uh, reduce the uh, transportation cost by 160 percent by converting the feedstock into um, uh, biochar. So uh, there is a significant benefit of doing that, and then and then the uh, um, so uh, once you have. Uh, the limited the um, the hauling cost from uh, uh, the uh, forest to the uh, conversion site it become a uh, longer say uh, more than 15 mi 15 miles 10 to 15 miles then you can move that unit to the location where you have a more uh, close access to the uh, the biomass that is the uh, uh, one of the main benefits of the uh, what we are looking at. Another idea is with the, related to that is the uh, volume of the material is highly uh, scattered, small volume scattered. So uh, in that case, one central location hauling the large volume of the biomass into one central location becomes um, uh, becomes a bit expensive. So the, the, I think the, the, that is I think one of the main benefits of having a mobile unit compared to one fixed large scale unit. Uh, the main downside would be uh, your uh, 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 the uh, production cost of the unit production cost of production of biochar producing biochar uh, tend to be uh, much more expensive than one central large uh, centralized large scale production operation. It, yeah, it's really we, not mutually exclusive at all. It's all site based. You know, especially when you're talking about forestry and forest biomass, there's such a variety of different situations. Um, so for instance, you know, in the wildland urban interface, uh, you've got all in my county, there's like uh, thousands of small woodland owners who have 10 acres or less that they're managing. And there, you know, we also have biomass one here that's one of the biggest biochar producers in the in the country. And they, you know, I work with them a lot. They love what I'm doing because I'm actually promoting biochar, the, you know, by reaching out to people, like getting them to experience it firsthand, they're learning about biochar. But more than that, they can't send out a, a grinder and a, and a truck to pick up a little pile here and a little pile there. So even when the distances aren't great, just the fact that it's scattered amongst a lot of different ownerships, um, it's not efficient really to collect it all up um, to send it to Biomass One, even though it's only 30, 40 miles away. So um, there are just so many different issues around biomass handling that we need all the tools in the toolbox for this. Yeah, um, I, uh, Kelpie, I, you made a point right at the, I think a very good point you made it. Yes, I 100% concur. Uh, you know, the things, mm -hmm. uh, that's another uh, the, the things I was gonna mention that the, uh, depending on the situation uh, where you can apply the very small scale, uh, the uh, uh, the biochar production we can, uh, the, uh, you know, Kelpie uh, mentioning, and uh, we can use moderate, um, a mobile, mobile, uh, a moderate scale using mobile technology. Well, once big centralized scale, uh, scale operation, I think uh, the combination of all of those, uh, like uh, use all the tools, as you said, Kelpie mentioned about all the options, uh, the, whatever the, the uh, most economical, most financially beneficial, I think that it should be way, the way to go. 
I think another one that we haven't really talked about at all here, which I think is really important for the multiple benefits is the combined heat and biochar type of furnace that can be designed and used in a small industrial situation, like a, you know, a, a small timber mill for, for lumber drying or food processing. You know that there are, and, and you know, Tom and I did this study for the university or for Nebraska Forest Service on this, looking at existing technologies that are quite affordable, and um, you know, small biomass heating plants that make that make biochar um, are really really feasible in these situations where they can draw from a, a closer in kind of woodshed to operate, and it could be very economical. Is that a proprietary study, Kelpie, or is that available through USBI somehow? That is now a USBI white paper, and it's on our website. Um, we have started a biochar learning center. This is our one of our big initiatives right now. Uh, in addition to re reviving the newsletter, is we're actually trying. We're going to be creating a database of materials, and we have a committee, you know, that's reviewing them because there's a lot of information out there. And you know, we just did a survey asking people where they get their information from, and they get it from a lot of uh, interesting places. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there that where the public is getting its information. Some of these are very good, and some of them are not so good. So, what we're trying to do is create an information hub um, and a database of of resources that are getting, going to be useful to, um, and helpful to the end user of biochar. I have a recommendation, Kelpie, um, since you're doing that anyway. In the EU, uh, when we did cost, we created what's called a um, uh, charchive. Uh, uh -huh. It's an archive of chars. Um, I think we got over 10,000 of them there. So that's something that we might want to put together here in the United States. A database of, of chars with um, characterized chars? Yes. Yeah, UC Davis has something like that, and so we'll be we'll be linking to that for sure. A good idea. Yeah, and I think it's also great if we could around the world because you got a lot of people stovepiped. And what I liked about this whole forum is that we're getting rid of the stovepiping around the world. I mean, you've got Simon Manley from the UK. You've got people from all over the world. I would encourage that we do more of that. Agreed. Absolutely. <laughs> We're running down on, we've got about five minutes left, and I just want to quickly run through the other speakers uh, who haven't had any chance to perhaps have any questions for them. I think Steve McCorkle is still with us, uh, and he talked about scaling production of carbon negative biochar and jet fuel. Is there, are there any questions for his presentation? I, I just had a quick question for Stephen. Um, what was the throughput of your systems uh, and and I got I'm not sure if it was your presentation or somebody else but sometimes I see in the presentations the term gasification gasify is versus pyrolytic carbon capture or something like that uh, we're using pyrolysis and gasification and what was the throughput well we are using pyrolysis to answer your question can you hear me okay yes we're using pyrolysis and then we're taking the same gas to convert it to pick the coke is that you you're kind of fuzzing out. Yeah, I heard you in the beginning, but then you fuzzed out. So we're using we're using pyrolysis to form the same gas, and then the same gas is converted into the citric jet fuel right on the site. The throughput we have fairly small units that can be placed in parallel, so one ton per hour type of units uh, for both the SP and the um, and the pyrolysis unit. But it makes permitting much easier, especially here in California, because they are temporary. They can be temporarily permitted. They can be scaled up. You know, regulators are much more comfortable with something that doesn't have permanent infrastructure in the ground, like these bio refineries or ethanol refineries, you know, that are just rubbing bolts in the landscape. Uh, they're much more comfortable with something that can be moved right to the source of the feed stock on the farm. And then if the farm goes out of business or fire flood or flood or whatever happens in the natural disaster sense, uh, forces people to leave, you can simply disconnect the equipment and move it out. It's all truck movable. 
including our building. So they're all temporarily permitted, which is, which is a much easier way to get permitted here in California. So the products that we produce are both uh, in terms of biochar and fisher cooked wax and liquids, and mostly wax, 80% wax to our clients. And it's a very um, attractive kind of food stock for refineries because it's a 95% refined product that can be hydrocracked by any refinery, standard equipment, into jet fuel, fuel therapy, whatever they need to make their quotas and rinse credits, but it's sulfur free. And it costs an oil refinery a lot of money to refine out sulfur from petroleum based fuel. Um, so, just blending in some of our sulfur free jet fuel and save the refinery a lot of money to get those sulfur levels down, even for us to live sulfur California, we should be at 15, 15 parts per million in our sulfur content. But the point is that we're leaving the plant next to the feedstock instead of the other way around, so we're saving the largest cost of biofuel production, which is typically the feedstock, and the highest cost of the feedstock is transporting the feedstock to the central plant. So we're moving the central, we're moving the plants to the source of the feedstock, and then we're creating this energy dense, compact in volume, fisher cove wax and biochar products, which are uh, very easy to transport the final markets, and of course, in the, in the agricultural environment, the final markets for the biochar are right there. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> you could only hear a little bit of the actual. Oh, really? Is it my... I, I heard it. I didn't have too okay. much trouble. Okay. So, Raymond, um, can we just continue on here for those who are yeah, interested? We, we can go another 15 minutes. Uh, I made, I gave okay. it a minute extension if anybody wants. Okay. I want to move to uh, Gloria Flora's presentation, Building a Sustainable Biochar Industry. I was curious if there are any comments or questions for Gloria. Well, I, I think it's you know one of the key components that we need to examine moving forward. As I said before, I think we all need to be aware and to you know look over those great slides that she had and, and examining what we're doing and are we actually um, doing things as we should instead of doing things as we're just used to in the society that we're in. And so anyway, I really appreciated her uh, her comments on that. I'd just so like to make a comment with regard to the whole air quality issue with regard to the sustainability. Um, it was one of the components when we put together our workshop was to try to bring that, that sort of issue forward in terms of design of new, new systems and, and holistic outcomes. I think Gloria hit that really well, but gener or more generically, around the ecological benefits. Um, but the air emission issue is a big deal. And any of our work working forward with new systems really needs to have a good look at that. So, so I, couldn't, I, I a, couldn't agree more with that statement. We're all about the air emissions in Southern California with South Coast Air Quality Management District. We've got the only paralysis unit um, that's ever received a full operating permit from South Coast, considered to be the most stringent in the world now. Uh, you know, they, they set a lot of EPA standards. They set standards for Detroit. And their claim to fame was cleaning up the LA basin, you know, by a factor of, of four times in the last 25 years. Just, I, I wanted to make a quick comment too. We've been working with CAPCOA, which is the parent organization of the uh, air districts in California, and we have a real booster there. Um, who, and we've got a proposal uh, to them to do emissions testing, uh, both in the field and at the Montana Fire Lab for uh, open burns versus conservation burns versus the, uh, the kiln. Bring a fire kiln. 
So we're working on that. And I think getting that data is going to be really important. Jim's involved in that as well. In that. And we're hoping to get that funded. So uh, it, that is a critical factor, although you have to compare it to, what, to what's happening now. And what's happening now in a lot of cases is just going up into smoke. And um, you know, any way we can improve that uh, to us is an advantage, but we need that real data. So we're working on that. Well, one way you can improve that is keeping the same gas from going up in smoke by converting it to something like that. <laughs> you Marshall, you were gonna, Marshall, you were gonna say something? Well, I, I had kind of a question. Um, in her presentation, was it her presentation that talked about um, uh, the, 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 the uses of char? In other words, the markets? Was that where she said 54 markets, or was that somebody else? That was me. Yeah, so, um, oh, that was Gloria. OK, so sorry. Because <laughs> I was just going to say, um, if you read the latest book by um, uh, Kathleen Draper and, and her co-author, um, she wrote that article through the Ithaca Institute on the 55 uses of biochar. But as of last year, she's already acknowledged 100,000 markets. So, and, and as co-chair of working group three in, on the commercialization of biochar in Europe, uh, I, I concur with her that there's that many markets out there. I was speaking about generic uses and not markets. Okay, I stand corrected. Sorry. Not a problem, and, but I'm glad you added that important fact. There's actually 55 if you include uh, transporting dead bodies. <laughs> As per Lonesome Dove. Actually, I know all about that because our systems are manufactured in Italy. And when the, uh, when the regulatory bodies there came to us during the pandemic, they want to know, uh, can we still manufacture? And our systems are being manufactured, but not for pyrolysis. It's actually being manufactured for crematories because of all the dead bodies from COVID. Yikes. I, I was not talking about the cremation side of it. I was just... Um, talking a little tongue in cheek about the book Lonesome Dove where the uh, main character's body was transported from Montana to Texas in a casket stuffed with biochar. Right, yeah. Anyway, we need to get Paul Simon to write a song, 50 Ways to Stash Your Biochar or something like that. <laughs> but, um, let's move on uh, to uh, Josiah's talk leveraging existing infrastructure in California. A quarter of a million tons of biochar per year in five years. Are there any comments, questions for Josiah? I think it's totally doable what he's saying. I do too. I, I, I like the use, Josiah, that you've made of your uh, California biochar model. And one of these days we're gonna sit down and we're gonna work to splice it in with the stuff I've been doing. And I think uh, there's a lot of value that can be gained from doing that. And so I just compliment you on developing that and uh, doing it the way you have. And this is okay. really low hanging fruit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I put up a question a little bit ago there, um, mm -hmm. also, uh, I, I'm, I'm really, well, I guess we can get to that. There, there is one more speaker after me. Um, uh, Jim, I just want to bring that, bring that your attention to that, that question I put up there that, uh, I, I'm really curious to hear from, from somebody outside of the biotech industry, maybe somebody who might've been viewing this for the first time or is viewing this, um, with, with uh, ideas of donations, investments, or collaboration within the industry. I'm really interested to hear um, what they might have to say about what they've seen in the past couple of days. So I think uh, Tom gave a great presentation um, after, after mine. So then maybe after that, we can open up that other question there. Thanks, Josiah. Um, yeah, let's briefly just move to Tom's and then we'll come back to, uh, to Josiah's question. 
Um, any questions, uh, comments about Tom's presentation on building capacity in biochar advocacy and educational organizations? All the I's, the IBIs, the USBIs, the SBIs, and so on. I think the reality is we just all need more money to build capacity and work on the programs we want to. And uh, so um, hopefully we can continue to market um, all of this, all of these great presentations. And, you know, even those that couldn't make it uh, or maybe, you know, didn't want to spend the time, we can still, I'm still going to be sending out to all of our big list of the, um, uh, the other uh philanthropies and social impact investors, et cetera. And I encourage you all to do that as well uh, and send them to the website um, to listen because the, uh, I think that's how we're gonna you know, gain more interest for sure. Kelpie has a comment, uh, I think that's relevant to Tom's presentation, which is should we consolidate some of these organizations? I think that's a great question. And it also ties in with uh, the thing that I suggested yet another organization called the Endowment for Biotar Based Community Development. And so this is a question that I think needs to be considered is how do we best organize ourselves uh, to be most efficient? And uh, is consolidation a wise thing or should we maintain our diversity the way we are and sort of let them go as they, as they can? Any thoughts on that? Well, again, there are just like, you know, that there are many different ways and, you know, it's place specific. And uh, I think that there are sort of on the ground uses for uh, more regional uh, organizations that you can't do, you know, on a national level. So I'm not sure how we consolidate necessarily because we're, we're sort of attacking different things. We're doing on the ground trainings and education and more community-based stuff. And, you know, the national and international groups are doing the important work that you know, us little guys can't do. So I don't know. Um, I think it's certainly worth talking about. I have a recommendation. Um, I belong to a number of different organizations because of the different things I'm involved in. And a lot of these organizations, I have an umbrella over them and then they have regionalization uh, that are kind of independent, but filter underneath the umbrella organization. That's one approach. And it's very common in the United States and also around the world. I, I think, um, you know, on the topic of consolidation, um, we were looking at consolidating the eyes, as you would put it, I think, Jim Amanette, um, International Biochar Initiative, United States Biochar Initiative, Sonoma Biochar Initiative. Um, I think that those are actually, you know, a nice little um, size, their scale, you know, Sonoma is a, a, a locally focused organization. Um, United States Biochar Initiative is a locally focused, or, focused organization with a large region, with a larger region than the Sonoma Biochar Initiative. And the International Biochar Initiative is, of course, um, focused on the region of Earth. Um, where I see a lot of overlap or potential redundancy is that across the pond over with the European biochar certificate, um, there is, you know, I guess, a coversion evolution, you know, where they're developing a lot of the same things that the IBI and USBI are developing in ways that I think do offer a greater opportunity for collaboration and or consolidation. Um, for instance, the the IBI certificate versus the EBC certificate. Um, the methodology, uh, such as the carbon sink uh, guidelines, and um, from what I understand, the IBI is now undertaking another development towards a methodology. Um, so I do see, I, and I don't think we've talked much about the EBC, which is interesting. Um, I, I do think that there is a lot of potential there for collaboration, consolidation of some sort. And I'm um, wondering if anyone else has some thoughts to share on that. 
Yeah, um, speaking from uh, that side of the pond, uh, I agree. Um, I think that uh, the IBI and EBC work does cross over. I always, I found it um, surprising and astonishing, you know, 10 years ago, whenever it was, when um, the EBC certificate sort of um, popped up and uh, it, it was such a small sector back then and to have two certification bodies uh, <laughs> uh, with such a small sector seemed crazy, but um, they, they, they do some fantastic work and uh, as does the IBI. So I think to, to combine the expertise um, and, and the outputs, I think, would be incredibly valuable um, to create a more sort of international movement. I should mention we have a discussion of that very issue with some input from Hans Peter Schmidt um, in the report, the, the biochar, biomass to biochar workshop report. Um, and it's an interesting discussion. So. It would be great to have one organization that, that could take in all the money you know, everybody could focus it on that organization and then they could distribute it to everybody else in some way um, because everybody's going after, uh, you know, the same uh, sources of money in many cases, uh, including, you know, in grants and everything else. And we're all competing against each other. So it would be, you know, something to think about um, if we could consolidate that together, especially the fundraising, but then everybody could get some money from that. I think that's kind of the thinking behind the endowment um, to let the financial side of it go go through something like that. Well, um, let's return one last moment to um, Josiah's question. And uh, the question really had to do with, are there any folks here who are new to the biochar space who's been here for the last day or two. And we're just curious uh, if they have any comments on what they've seen, what they liked, uh, what we could do better, that sort of thing. And whether they even want to unmask themselves, that's another question. So uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. Almost everyone here uh, now, we, we're down to 21 people. We had about 28 at the beginning. Um, I think our you know, biochar people, uh, I think there's a few that aren't, but um, so it'd be great if you could uh, you know, give us a little feedback, but you can also do that um, you know, by contacting Jim or contacting me or, or whatever. I'd sure like to get some feedback. Raymond, um, I, I was trying to pay attention to the the viewer count, it looks like it was often hovering, you know, well above 50 and somewhere usually below 100. Um, but I think a lot of people were coming and going. Mm -hmm. um, and of, of that visitor list, I think you, you had sent out a lot of personal invitations. Uh, and then additionally, there was kind of a blast at the end. Do you have any comments on the visitor uh, list and, and uh, how many of them were in your initial blast and how many of them showed up? Um, it depended. Uh, Yesterday, I would say, I think we were up to 101 uh, people at the, at the top. And, um, you know, we, we didn't get as many of the, you know, the philanthropies and the social impact investors. There were some, but not as many as I would have liked, which is, again, why, you know, I'm hoping that continued mailings to these people once they've been pre-recorded and they can look at them at their leisure it will give this much greater legs than what we had. But my goal was to have 100, 100 people. Um, initially, uh, when we were gonna do it in Sonoma, I was looking to have maybe 40 of these people. But I think we did expand on the, uh, the numbers by doing it this way. And, um, you know, we, we, we ended up, I ended up sending off to the whole uh, um, SBI mailing list uh, on Saturday, I think, and then I think I did it again on Monday. Um, so we, we got a lot of additional people that were, you know, from the biochar community from that. Today we had fewer people. I think at the, at the top, we might've had 80 or 85 or something, but then people, you know, slowly, uh, logged off after that. So I'm encouraged, um, that we have these numbers, but I'm a little discouraged that we didn't have as many of the uh, sort of the audience that I was really hoping for. 
Would you like to disclose if you've had any uh, recent donations since this started? I had a fifty dollar. We had a fifty dollar donation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's something. Yeah, yeah. No, we certainly appreciate that. Any, anything's good. Um, and again, you know, we would not have. Thought, we we got a forty thousand dollar donation uh, initially to put this thing on, and it's actually going to cost more than that. <laughs> After everything's all said and done, we wouldn't have been able to do it if we if we had hadn't had that initial donation. Uh, and that's where John Masuras of uh, Venn Earth came, uh, came from. That's mm. where he came from. So that was really, really, a, you know, jump started the whole idea and the whole thing. So um, he knows about it. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so I'm going to continue to blast out, you know, maybe personally one at a time rather than a big blast to a lot of these. And I hope you do too, once we get these, um, get these up on the web. All righty, well, I think I just wanna thank uh, all the speakers for uh, presenting. I know it was a lot of work and uh, all the participants for asking questions. And I think we had a great discussion this afternoon and uh, to stay in touch, we, we can go to uh, scalingbiochar.com and and uh, see the final version of this when it's all wrapped up. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, Raymond. Yeah, thank you all, uh, really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully um, this has kind of opened up a whole you know new audience um, and um, we can push this push this thing forward. So thank you all, really appreciate it.